Southwestern family of companies welcomes you to the Action Catalyst. Each week, our diversely and amazingly accomplished guests share their insights and inspirations to help us ignite our own. So let's invest attention together to breathe, to reflect and refocus, and decisively defeat that voice we call Mr. Mediocrity. Then let's enjoy moving forward to make a positive difference in our world. This episode is brought to you by Thinking Ahead. Thinking Ahead's diverse team of executive recruiters specialize in executive level talent acquisition in the world's most competitive and sought after industries. As an employee owned company, Thinking Ahead has award winning consultants widely recognized as subject matter experts in their respective specialties, including banking, life sciences, healthcare, nonprofit, IT and gaming, energy, legal, security, and sales. Since 1982, Thinking Ahead has built expertise and delivered results that keep their clients engaged year after year. They believe that recruiting is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Their wide-ranging expertise enables them to ask the right questions, arrive at the best answers, and deliver desired results quickly. They continue to excel on their mission to connect the right people with the right organizations at the right time. Visit thinkingahead.com to learn more about how our specialists can help you recruit top-level talent, or serve as a trusted advocate in your career search. If you're looking for a change or looking to get a start, there's a place for you at the Southwestern family of companies. We invest in our employees using industry best practices to help you refine your skills, take control of your vision, and build your own independent business. We build principle-guided businesses by recruiting purpose-driven people. And if that sounds like you, we'd love to talk. Head to southwestern.com and click on Opportunities to review our mission, learn about our culture, and see how a place the Southwestern family of companies can help you create impact in your career and the world. On today's episode, we welcome Paul Ossiante, the men's squash and tennis coach at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut two-time Olympic coach of the year, and world championship coach known for his unique achievement as the winningest coach in college sports history, with 17 NCAA championship titles. His book, Run to the Roar, Coaching to Overcome Fear, is now being made into a film. We hope you enjoy. Coach Paul, what I'd love to do is have people talk about some of the most important pivot points in their own careers, how they went from starting out to how they ended up here? Because sometimes they're expected, sometimes they're totally unexpected. Sure. I think really for me, I've lived a life with a pretty heavy dose of the imposter syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> Can't believe this is happening to you, eh? Yeah, or just, you know what, I'm, I have to prove they're wrong. And really that's kind of the way it's been. You know, I, I was born in the Bronx, right across the street from Yankee Stadium. I wasn't a very good student. We moved to the suburbs when I was about 13. And I remember having a high, high school guidance counselor say, well, you're just not college material. So, you know, think about something else in life. And I thought about him on graduation day, <laughs> both in high school and both in college. And then I went to a college and I wanted to be an athlete. And my coach cut me three times and I just wasn't a very good listener and I wanted to prove him wrong. And I became a national champion. And then I went off to coach at West Point. And what an overwhelmingly powerful place. And I was there to coach. And I had an injury. And a coach in another sport quit. I applied to be his replacement. I had no right getting that job. And they offered that job to seven other people, all of whom turned it down. They said, God, we have no one else. We have to give this kid the job for a year. So they gave me the job for one year in the interim, and I got to stay there for 13 years and prove them wrong. <laughs> now, now, you mentioned you switched from one sport to another, from where to where? So I was a gymnast. Okay. I was a, a gymnast in college, and I went to go to West Point to coach and train for the Pan American team. Mm -hmm. And I had a pretty catastrophic injury while I was there. And I thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up a new activity. I started playing tennis. And I got pretty good at tennis pretty quickly because tennis is a lot easier than gymnastics. So when the coach from West Point quit, they were stuck with me. The irony of that was 
they took me downstairs to the second floor of the gym and they said, this is a squash court and you're now the head squash coach at United States Military Academy. I'd never seen that court. I didn't know what it was. So on the first day of practice, the man with the imposter syndrome, I said to the young cadets, I said, guys, I have no idea what you're doing. (laughs) I don't know what those lines are. I have no idea. But it seems to me that this is all about fitness. So I'll make you the most fit team in the country and you teach me this game. So that was the first time I ever saw a squash ball. I won a world doubles championships in squash. That's incredible. So again, it was just, no, I'm not going to have other people dictate what's possible. Now, this seems like a lifelong trait that you have. Yeah, (laughs) I think that's the case. So after West Point, was it Trinity was your next stop? No, I took a club job to make a lot of money and played professionally in both tennis and squash, bounced around, coached at some other colleges. And then 28 years ago, and honestly, during that time, Dan, I went through a bit of a lost period. Hmm. Thought I was being terribly efficient, but I really wasn't. And then I got the Trinity job and I've been here 28 years. I've been the U.S. national coach for 26 of those years. I've had the honor of coaching world team tennis for 11 of those years. Uh, Worked with Billie Jean King and it's been a, a ridiculously lucky journey for me. That is absolutely incredible. One of the young men on our team was the son of Tom Wolfe the world famous author, Mm -hmm. Tom Wolf and I became very close friends. And Tom said to me, coach, you're going to write a book. I'm going to help you. As a result of that, we wrote a book, which is now about to be made into a movie. And this is run to the roar, run to the roar. That's amazing. Well, and of course, Tom Wolf started as a nonfiction writer with a very creative bent and then bonfire, the vanities, a man in full, so many wonderful novels as well. Incredible. Incredible. The first time I met him, he walked around the bend at the squash center and he in walks this man all dressed in white. And I said, Tom, you must have a, a fairly easy time picking out your outfits in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, coach, the first thing you need to do is I need to get you an agent. I said, okay. <laughs> and so one day I'm out on the tennis courts coaching and my cell phone rings. And this man says, uh, coach, I just spoke to Tom Wolf and uh, um, I'd like to be your agent. And so, you know, being the jerk that I am, I said, oh, sure. Why would I, why would I agree to have you be my agent? And he said, that's a good question. Uh, I'm the agent of Mitch Albom, Tuesdays with Maury, and Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Code. And I said, oh, I, I think you can be my agent. <laughs> you passed the interview. <laughs> <laughs> that is terrific. But I'd love to, to delve a little bit more into your, your attitude toward these twists and turns, because when we look at the accolades, the winningest coach in the history of college sports, longest winning streak of any coach in any sport, it's easy to imagine you never hit a brick wall anywhere along the way. What can you look back on and say when a person encounters a brick wall that they can't see around, can't see under, over, what are some things that have always kept you moving so that you could ultimately surpass that? Well, I think as Confucius says, he who loves what he does can never find work. And in every step that I've taken, the central message for me was that I was put on this earth to help people. Mm -hmm. And sport was going to be my vehicle to help them be more prepared for later in life. There's a quote on the plaque on a wall at West Point that changed my life. And it's a MacArthur quote. And the quote is on the friendly fields of strife are sown the seeds that on later fields will bear the fruits of victory. I honestly believe that I could learn to help people and negotiate their journey through sport. Now, it's interesting, all these accolades and all of that, those are other people keeping score. My paycheck is getting invited to former players' weddings, to getting birth notices. I'm a I'm a godfather for eight former players' children. But when you hit a wall, and listen, you learn more through losing than you learn from winning. When you win, you're on to the next one. When you lose, the train stops. And everybody runs out with their magnifying glasses and says, oh, what just what happened here? What can we learn from this? Did we not have the right plan? Did we not prepare for it correctly? What, what happened? And sometimes life simply happens. So when there's a brick wall in front of you, you have two choices. You can bang your head 
against that wall in the same place every day, every minute, over and over and over. Sometimes that wall will give away. Sometimes you simply have to step back and say, wait a minute, what really went on here? What's the lesson? What can I take away from this? How can I be resilient? The single most important quality in the business world, in the athletic world, is resilience. Mm -hmm. I am frightened that we are destroying an entire generation of children because we're not giving them enough ownership over their journey. Mm -hmm. And as a result, when they face adversity, they fall into a million pieces because mommy and daddy have done it for them all the way up until this point. So resilience is the key. And you can only demonstrate resilience by failing. You can only demonstrate bravery by being frightened. When we wrote Run to the Roar, Dan, it was written as an apology to my three grown children mm. because I wasn't there for them when they were growing up. Now, when I speak to companies, I'm the guru of work-life balance. So it's the learning from losing. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that characterizes your, your whole style is you don't tackle a sport from a strategic top down. It's the player up, the individual that works the best. Can you share a little bit of your thoughts on that regard? Well, again, I don't care about the outcome. I care about the person and I care about helping them negotiate the journey. And so it really is about the person. And coaching elite athletes, which we've been fortunate enough to get, and being a good leader in the business world, you need to have one single important quality in my view, and that's empathy. Mm. You cannot help a person if you cannot put yourself in their shoes. You have to be able to stand on the other side of the desk and understand where that person is coming from. You know, I've got a young man on my team from Lahore, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. He made as a young man from Mumbai, India. One's a Muslim, one's a Hindu. They've got all kinds of stuff they've got to work through. Mm -hmm. I have to get in their shoes. And so it's all about the person. Sometimes you need to challenge them. Sometimes you need to hug them. I'm a big believer in the Japanese philosophy, which is that you cry in practice and you laugh in competition. So people see me on game day with my arm around their son's shoulder and they say, wow, what a nice man. I, I wish he was my coach. Well, not all the time. <laughs> you mm -hmm. might not want me coaching you during practice because practice is everything in the business world, on the athletic fields. Now, it's not hard to get a 20-year-old excited to play Harvard on game day, but it's very hard to have that young person find relevance in practice on a Wednesday when nobody's watching. And that's when good coaches make their money. Mm. It's the motivation of engagement day in and day out to be the best version of yourself you can be every day. Mm -hmm. Bobby Knight once said, the will to win is important, but not as important as the will to prepare. And I followed Bobby Knight at West Point. The coaches that I was surrounded by at West Point so far exceeded anything I've ever accomplished. And I got to cut my teeth around those guys. And, you know, I've, I've, I've spoken to the Patriots. Knight and Belichick are very close. And for them, they, they analyze things almost like a battlefield. It's really interesting, these people. Well, Duke of Wellington said that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. A hundred percent. It's got to be the case, right? Yeah. Dan, the other thing I've stumbled upon that you may find of interest, one of the things I've learned is to become a Stoic. To me, the centerpiece of Stoicism, which is not a religion, it's a, it's a lifestyle, right. is the serenity prayer. The serenity prayer is the deal. So we, all of these coaches go out and they hire these million-dollar sports psychologists to come in and teach their players how to manage their emotions in a game. What do you end up with as a person that's pretty good in a game, but maybe not any better at life? So we're approaching every day as the serenity prayer. And I can't change that. Or I will change that. Or thank you for the wisdom of being able to tell the difference. So to me, if you can approach every minute of your day like that, you're going to be a more happy, balanced person. You know, so you get stuck in traffic. That's an opportunity to daydream. You can't change that. And that's where I'm focused right now. And the same in people that I speak to in the business world. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the serenity prayer also makes that resilience possible that you spoke about. A hundred percent, but you must fail to be resilient. You must be willing to accept that failure is a part of the journey. In universities today, Dan, I've been doing this for 45 years. I see people coming to school now that look more put together than they've ever looked before. They present so beautifully. I'm seeing more cheating in college than I've ever seen. Why? Because they cannot accept failure. Mm. It isn't a part of their journey. And it's the most critical part of their journey. That's your progress report, man. That's what tells you what adjustments you need to make. That's when we find the medal of a person is not when they're winning. It's when they're losing. It's character. That's the character. Character. You know, years ago, I had a chance to meet a man named Gil Brandt, who was the director of player development for the Dallas Cowboys, vice president. And they would evaluate potential pro prospects like most of the other teams did, size, speed, weight, accomplishments, et cetera. But they had one extra dimension. And Coach Brandt called that character. And I said, how do you measure character? He said, when they're knocked down and they're flat on their back, we hit a stopwatch. How quickly do they get up? Oh, I love that. If there's an interception and they lost the ball, how quickly do they run off the field at the sideline? Do they ever throw their helmet in despair? That's how we measure character. And they had a chance to pick up a Heisman Trophy winner in the draft, and they passed on him to pick a lesser-known player from Pittsburgh named Tony Dorsett. <laughs> Very telling about character. Yes. For them, and we try to do the same thing. When we're recruiting, we try to measure character. Mm -hmm. You know, especially at my age, I mean, come on, I'm a lot closer to the end than I am to the beginning. With with your track record, I would never take that bet. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be around a bunch of knuckleheads. So what I do is when I'm recruiting a person, I don't speak to his coach. His coach is going to tell you this guy is the next coming. Right. I talk to the opponent's coaches. How did he handle himself when he won? How did he handle himself when he lost? Did he play by the rules? You know, character is a measure of what you do when nobody's watching. Mm-hmm. Now, could you comment just a moment on how you work to meld together these diverse personalities? Because highly talented people are not cut from the same cloth. How do you pull the team aspect of unity in a sport that's primarily about individual performance? Well, I've never coached this as an individual sport. It's, for me, it's all about the team because I know that when they graduate and they come back with their partner in 10 years, they won't remember any match results. They'll remember the trip in the snow to Williamstown and that sort of thing. So... We very much focus on the family and the team. It's a little bit of beating them over the head. Your first day of practice, I sit them down under the 17 banners. And I say, look to your left, look to your right. This is your brother. And when you're born, you don't get to choose your brother. But there he is. And in time and through battle and through difficulties, you're going to learn that this person next to you is critically important to your journey. And you will lead to him. And we build a spider web of connectedness. And it's repeated every single day. And we hold people up to a standard and we help people understand the importance of caring about each other as much, if not more than they care about themselves. It's interesting. I'll tell you a quick story. I hope it's quick. We were at the national championships at Princeton and we had a young man on the court from Mamo, Sweden, and he was playing a Princetonian tiger from uh, Kuala Lumpur. The young man he was playing, he owned. He'd beaten him every single time like a drum. Here we are in the national finals, and I'm getting completely outcoached, and the Princeton player is up 2-0. My guy comes off the court, and his head is down, and I can tell that he's beaten. He has accepted failure. He's hit heartbreak hill, and he's willing to walk in now. So I said, Gustav, look me in the eye, and he wouldn't. So I just picked his chin up, and I said, look me in the eye. And of course, as I'm talking, I'm getting louder and louder. I said, Gustav, you've come to the place where you can accept failure. And I understand that. But the person on the next court from Trinity is fighting for you. And the person on the other court from Trinity is fighting for you. You cannot give in. You must fight for your teammates. He goes, runs back on the court to get away from this crazy man. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm pointing at him through the glass between every point. And they have about halfway through the third game, which he's losing, he have a long, arduous point. And as they brush past each other, the young man from Princeton stumbles a little bit. And Gustav stands straight up, looks outside the glass at me and smiles. <laughs> he knows that this kid is tired now and he's going to win the match. And he knows if he was playing for himself, he would have lost that match. 
but he found a way to hang in there for his teammates. And he won us the national championship. And those are the lessons that these boys learn in here as we go along. It's about each other. When I tell people, when you walk into a person's office, look at the pictures on their wall. Ask them questions about those pictures because those pictures mean something to that person. Begin building a spider web of connectedness everywhere in your life. Expand a little bit more on that spider web because I can see the image, but I take the spider web means multiple connections across every dimension of that universe. A hundred percent. There is no center. Every single connection is the center of a new center and it spreads out that way. And everyone just needs to be treated kindly and fairly with with the three little asiente girls we just have one rule be a kind and gentle person Mm -hmm. and everything else takes care of itself i speak at these companies dan and and it's usually at a retreat and the ceo gets up and and says okay well this is how we did last year in the fourth quarter and these are our metrics of what we want to try to accomplish this year and here's coach asiente and i get up there and i say that's really great but I only care about people. If you take care of your people, the metrics will take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't usually get invited back for a second speech. (laughs) (laughs) No, but you change lives by that philosophy, regardless of what the CEO might think about it. Yeah, it's the whole point. Yeah, absolutely right. There's an old story where the punchline is when the person is right, then their world is right. I love that. Well, tell us a bit more about the book and becoming a major motion picture. And the full title of the book, everyone, is called Run to the Roar, Coaching to Overcome Fear. If you expand a little bit on the the full title and then this whole process of it becoming a major motion picture. So uh, another funny story. I get a phone call one day from our agent. He says, Coach, you have a problem. I said, okay. He said, "Uh, your title has been used before. I said, oh, my gosh, what does that mean? And he said, well, the good news is you can't copyright a title. So you can still use your title. And I said, well, out of interest, who used our title before us? It was Tammy Faye Baker. (laughs) 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 So basically, the the idea of run to the roar is it came from my therapist. So I'm a neurotic mess. I, you know, I have the disease to please. I, I want everyone happy. And I go to see my therapist. And one day he says to me, coach, I want to give you a psychological phrase. And that phrase is run to the roar. And he said, you are a nut. He said, you are so conflict avoidant. And yet every weekend you lead men into battle. It makes no sense, but that's what you do. And he said, so here's the drill. In Africa, lions hunt in packs. And they're always the women, by the way, that do the hunting because they're the stronger sex. And they always take with them the oldest female of the pride. By this point, she's old and infirmed, pretty blind can no longer catch her own food. They position her in the middle of the field, facing the bush. The lionesses hide in the bush. And when the lion roars, the prey that are between she and the bush run away from the roar to their death. Mm -hmm. The lesson is run at the roar. You're going to find it's just a toothless old lady. Go at the problem. Ask yourself, what's the worst that can happen? And go at it, go at it, go at it. Figure out how to defeat it, to defuse it. And so I ask the boys rhetorically every day when they come in with a thorny problem, like, coach, I got my car towed last night or whatever it is. And I'll always ask the same question. What's the worst that can happen? Come to grips with that. There's no problem. Mm -hmm. You know, the samurai were the greatest fighters in history. And you know why? They embrace death. Mm -hmm. What's the worst that can happen? So that's where the title Runs to the Roar comes from. I think it's a phenomenal title. Well, Coach Paul, you have, uh, you've modeled resilience. You've modeled love as opposed to like. It's pretty easy to like people, harder to love them. You've shown that consistently throughout your career. What advice could you share with some of our listeners who are, who are maybe looking at the hand of cards they've been dealt? They can't find a single face card, let alone an ace in that hand. They're discouraged and they're, they don't know where to turn. What, what could you share? You know, my father used to say to me, the biggest danger in life is hopelessness. Somehow you have to find that ray of hope, something to grasp onto. 
you have to find a way to take yet another step and another step. There's a few things that I have found in my darkest moments that were really helpful. For one, my Bible was, has always been Tuesdays with Maury. And in the book, Maury is dying of ALS. And at the beginning of the book, they, they wheel his wheelchair out and they sit in a field and they observe nature. By the end of the book, he can't get out of his bed, but they move his bed around so he can look out and look at the trees. I would, one, and it seems so trite, try to engage with nature a couple of times a day. Whatever you're doing, go to a window. It's called shuttling in psychology. Step away, look out, breathe it in, take in the beauty of the world. Try to find it, even when it seems so hard. Connect with nature periodically through the course of the day. Try to find the beauty of you. You are the only you in the world. Try to find peace and, and calm in that. And say, you know what? This is me. This is what I am. I want to try to keep moving forward. I have a tattoo on my wrist. The tattoo says forward. Keep trying to move forward. And learn, learn that if this is what it is, I've got to find a way to find happiness in this. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think that's a real problem in our lives, and I've gone through divorce and I understand this, we sometimes look outside for help. We sometimes look outside for people to make us happy. It's in you. You got to go in there. You got to find you. You have to find the beauty of you, whatever it is. And then try to spread it. Pay it forward. The karmic circle is a powerful thing. You know, it takes you out of, and I don't mean this word critically, but it, it takes you out of your own self-induced pity party. Mm -hmm. Go out and help others. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dan. Coach Paul, this has been a very, very rapid, very powerful, meaningful time we've spent together. I love not only what you've accomplished, but your consciousness of being grateful, your consciousness of your place in the universe. I'm sure sometimes you look around and say, I guess I'm the luckiest guy that ever was. <laughs> Every day. And, uh, and yet you're not lucky. You, you have made it happen and done it in such great ways. We're delighted for you and your, your family. Thank you. And can't wait to see that movie. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. It hasn't been cast yet. Well, that's the big thing. They're trying to get the right person and COVID has kind of pulled it back. I keep telling the uh, people that I think it's going to be Pee Wee Herman, but whoever they saw. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just feel bad that we've lost Charlton Heston because I think he's got you as a dead ringer with the most yeah, yeah. beard going on there. Thanks for being on the Action Catalyst. My pleasure. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. To stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst Podcast and Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. Thanks for listening.